Um, I'm joined by two great academic, uh, didn't prepare any bio, but uh, to make it short, Giorgio on my left, but it's your right, so there is no political statement here, is a professor of computational law at uh, Tilburg University in the Netherlands, and Nicola is a professor of computational law at the EUI in Italy, where Giorgio was prior to Nicola. Anyway, long story short, um, and my name is Thibaut Schrepel, I'm an uh, associate professor at the VU University of Amsterdam. All right, a couple of things. So my job will be to make this panel as dynamic as possible. So we have quite a few segments. Uh, you'll be asked to vote in a minute, so get the smartphone ready. Um, and then I have prepared some surprise questions for my two guests over here. They have no idea what those questions are all about. So this should make it interesting. Um, before we start, I have to confess that there is one thing that I hate, and that is when the moderators actually take the floor and monopolize the panel. So what I tried on my way here yesterday on the plane is to get ready for the panel and to prepare a very short introduction. And then I realized that it wouldn't be fair to all of you if I was not at the very least to share in two minutes what are my thoughts on the subject so that when I ask them question and react, you know where I'm coming from. So I'll do that in just two minutes. Um, I think we are living throughout what I will call a constitutional moment in antitrust. And what I mean by that is that we are, I would argue, creating a new underlining layer on top of which we will put new enforcement policies and potentially um, broader policies in, in the years to come. And I think this is a defining moment and it has to be taken seriously. Uh, if you look at the literature, there are quite a su few subjects that are being discussed, whether or not antitrust should take sustainability into account. This was one of the panel. Industrial policy, the panel before ours. Digital sovereignty, worker rights, privacy. In the United States, you will read about anti-racism and antitrust. There is a desire to protect democracy or plurality of the press. Small businesses, LBG LGBTQ+, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what you often read, if you read this literature, and this is to some degree what we've heard today, is that not taking those objectives into account equals, under, un, equals hurting and reducing the underlining rights, right? So there is a clear causation as established in the literature. I'm not sure if that is there, but this is what you read about. And the corollary of that is that taking those objectives into account and making indeed antitrust broader and taking social goals into account equals maximizing the underlining rights, right? So maximizing the, the right of workers and so on and so forth. What is rarely discussed, and in my opinion, even less so clearly addressed with clear solution, because I think it's uncomfortable, is the following. First, is it effective in reaching those goals? And second, if effective, what are the trade-offs between those objectives and consumer welfare? I would have lost to, to ask one of the panel today, would you prefer to protect the poor or the environment? And it's a political choice. And also the trade-offs between those objectives, right? If you have to protect some businesses because it's implemented by some minorities, but it's also bad for the planet, which one would you choose? Now, in any case, despite the lack of answer regarding those trade-offs and the effectiveness of those policies, I think we all agree that it's coming, right? And to some degree, I could list already what's happening in the EU, in Japan, in the United States. Some of those policies are being implemented as we speak. So the approach we'll be taking on this panel um, is first to discuss whether or not we should do it, but then we will also discuss how to do it, right? Now, to be brief, I have a proposal that I would like to put on the table. And this is something that I would like to call the proof of vigilance. What I mean by that is a mechanism to ensure that we document the effects of those new policies and adapt the regulation and the experimentations along with the effect that we see on the market. I think there are three stages for that. The first might be to expect experimentalism. There are numerous ways you can use. You could use agent-based modeling. You could do lab experiments. The work of Vernon Smith, I, I think, is very helpful. You could also experiment in the real life, right? If you do that, you want to clearly define the objective 
when you say to protect the, the right of workers, what do you mean and how do you measure that? And I think it's a very in interesting discussion. And then, of course, you want to have some sensors on the market and get as much data as possible. If you're not doing that in 10 years, we can organize the same conference with the ideological stance and no empirical evidence. So that's step one. Step two, you make all that public, right? So you may, you may want to make the data and the process public so that people can judge and also research and see whether or not this is effective. And stage three might be that you, in my opinion, have to have the willingness as an agency to pivot very quickly. And there I could see different levels, levels of reaction to what's happening and what the data is, is showing. Uh, it could be to raise flags, whether or not this policy is working, to another degree, which is I abandon the policy. You know what? Antitrust doesn't work to protect the right of workers, right? So we have to do it differently. Um, now, if you want to do that, you may want to talk about institutional design, and I will stop there. I just want to say that legally, it is feasible for agencies to implement such experimentation. The rights are there. They have the um, discretion that they, they may need to actually implement those policies. Now, who should be in charge of implementing those policies and experimentations? I think that's a different one. Uh, if you want to talk about labor, you may want some social scientists and not just competition lawyers. If you want to protect sustainability, you may want to hire biologists and ecologists within competition agencies and so on and so forth, which of course is very costly. So at some point we can have to put the money on the table, right? And say, how much is it worth it? Um, and for that, the sensors to be effective, you want data, computer scientists, econ and lawyers. And if you've been working with those groups, you know it's hard, right? Because we don't have the same incentives. So that's what I wanted to say. And that's my, my take on a subject, try to be as empirical as possible. So now you know that I'm biased toward empirical evidence, which will inform some of my questions. Now, before we start, we want to know what you think of the question, knowing that it won't be as clear as possible. So the point of the question uh, and if you take a picture of the QR code, or if you go on the website, slido.com, you enter the event code ICLE, you will get to the question. The question is the following. Should antitrust pursue broader goals than consumer welfare, which is the theme of this panel? And it's not a referendum. It will be, I think, harder than what you expect. And it's not that Nicola would say yes or no, and Georgia would say the opposite, right? So don't take it personally. I will also ask you the very same question toward the end of the panel and, and see if indeed we managed or they managed to change people's minds in one direction or the other. So I'll just give you a minute. Um, I've made it so that you can see the results of people voting. Um, in the meantime, Nicola will sing a song. So we have the... <laughs> okay, uh, I see 21, 23 people voting. For now, it's pretty much 50-50. I'll come back to the results in a minute. But again, the QR code will lead you to the websites. And I will be asking the same question in about uh, 30 minutes to an hour. All right. I stop here. Part one of the discussion is, again, what should antitrust be all about? We have about 20 minutes for that. I asked them to answer me with short answers so that, again, we keep it very dynamic. I will start with you, Nicola. The first question is the following. How do you, you personally, approach the question in a way that is scientific as opposed to expressing your opinion based on political you know, education. So what's your method, again, addressing the question whether or not antitrust should should broaden and whether or not we should take more social objectives into account? Okay, um, so I try to keep three guidelines in mind. Okay. Guideline number one, uh, get the cause-effects relationship right. So we understand that competition forms uh, structural relations with other public interests. Increases in levels of rivalry have different impacts on other public interests. And so you want to invest into knowledge making in the first place. You want to understand, uh, you know, how uh, antitrust and economic and market power regulation impacts other public interest variables. OK, so for that, you need to have a clearly defined dependent variable, the public interest clearly defined that corresponds to a target for policymaking. For instance, when you talk about sustainability, are you talking about the big goal of long-term preservation of natural resources. Are you talking about the intermediate, intermediate target of reduction of CO2 emissions or uh, the even more intermediate targets of increasing renewable, renewable uh, sources? So that's tricky. 
The relationship should not be assumed between rivalry and the public interest. Um, that's tricky. It's not necessarily linear. It's not necessarily continuous. It's not necessarily positive or negative. For instance, rivalry leading to increased outputs does not align with a sustainability agenda that tries to limit the output produced on the planet. So if you are a degrowth minded person, you should not uh, tolerate or accept or promote increases in consumption enforcement. You should be against that. You should be in favor of monopoly as a social model. Second guideline, are the means good for the ends? Okay, so in the real world, firms might not compete on privacy. Okay, or to put differently, day-to-day -day market competition may mean less privacy because the competition is raised to the bottom. And um, if you, you know, define improved privacy as your end ideal state of the world, maybe the means are either less competition enforcement, um, imposition of privacy in the preference function of businesses like ESG disclosure requirements, or a privacy mandate like the GDPR. None of these implies more antitrust enforcement or more market power regulation, just the opposite. So you need to be very clear about what you're you know, trying to address. And the third one, I'll be very short here, integration of public policy targets, public interest targets is all about choice. You can't do everything. There's opportunity cost to policymaking, okay? And the second reason is the more you add public interests into the preference function of policymakers, the more you increase the harms from valuation of biases. So these are the three guidelines I try to stick to. Thanks a lot. Giorgio, same question. So again, how do you approach the question, the subject of this panel from a scientific way? So what's your method? Sure. Okay. I'll give a mundane answer as a lawyer. I look at the relevant laws. As somebody said before, you know, if you look at Article 1 of the Chinese constitutional law, you have a different take than if you look at Indonesia and then if you look at European. When you look at the US and the EU, the problem is that primary law isn't very helpful because it's very open textured. And so rather than relying on what people in the room tell me, I need to look at what the Court of Justice tells us. But yeah. even there, the Court of Justice isn't particularly helpful because it gives very open-ended uh, readings, uh, right? So Telia Sonera, uh, the public good, uh, post Denmark one, the as efficient competitor and consumer welfare. So you don't get much, much of a clear message there. But the court also said in Master Foods that it's for the commission to determine the competition policy. And so then you can look at how the commission does it. And I mentioned this because I think it's important to look at the fact that the commission is influenced historically by a number of exogenous and endogenous factors. Who is the commissioner? Uh, what is the current composition of the commission? What is the current political climate? What is the current economy? If you look at the competition policy reports in the 70s, we have an oil crisis. We need competition law to rescue firms because of an oil crisis. You look at the competition policy reports in the day 1990s and it's a period of great stability we need to protect consumer welfare you look today fairness so i think there's a, some work out there which tries to gauge the what is competition policy about empirically by just taking a lot of data and putting all that data together say what do people say what are the keywords that different people are saying but that's very a contextual and you need to first of all realize who has the power to say something about what it is it is the commission the court of justice can check uh, and then you know when do they say it um, that, that's sort of the lawyer's boring answer. As an economist, you might have a different criteria. You say, first of all, competition law uh, is just about prohibition. It prohibits certain conduct. So it's not got a lot of power. You know, it can just say no to some things that it doesn't like. And then you might look at the Tinbanger rule. One agency per policy. Don't have two policies in the heads of one agency. So make sure that agency does the job that it has a comparative advantage in doing. If you dilute that agency by balancing competing objectives, you lose the core mission. And then from there, an economist would say there is a risk to accountability, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, we have a problem. And all of this boils down to the fact that another way of thinking about the objectives of competition policy is not so much what should they achieve. But what competition law does. And so if competition law is about deterrence, then it should deter undesirable conduct. And that already narrows down a little bit the scope of what you can do. You've made a long shopping list. Mm -hmm. But how much of that shopping list can be achieved if all that the law does is deter certain conduct which it feels is undesirable? Yeah, thanks a lot. I like the framework very much. Um, I'll go again to you, Nicola. So now my question is, which objectives you think should be better integrated into antitrust rules and standards and again i'm not asking you know specifically about europe or the us you may want to specify that in the answer but so again which which ones whether on the list or elsewhere should be better yeah so okay so 
as Georgia was saying, I understand this is a debate, but I have the right to agree. Um, <laughs> Um, as Georgia said, we have uh, accomplices as lawyers, and I think this discussion first and foremost is very context dependent. The, the US legal system and the EU legal system are extremely different. Uh, the US is built on a system of absolute faith in economic competition as you know, the main provider of, of social welfare, and the EU has a regime that considers that cooperation, not competition, um, as should have more power over issues of social and public policy. And the proliferation of exceptions in Article 101, ancillary restraints, rule of reason, Wouters, Article 101.3, and so on and so forth, is just the best proof of this. So, um, you know, we have these legal rules. The institutions are very different, very private enforcement, adversarial in the US, much more technocratic and regulatory in the EU. So that tells you that, you know, there's probably more, you know, openness to public interest integration in the EU compared to the US. So that's... Uh, to get us started. Now, um, one of the delegates of the conference, Teresa Oriani, who is a researcher at the EUI, has done a lot of work on trying to look into public administration and uh, political science literature on you know, how political scientists think about successful integration. So which objectives work well together, right? And, and the literature has a bunch of very interesting things to say. So, um, political scientists would tell you that there's five barriers to successful integration. That's ignorance, professionalism, so that's specialty or expertise, turf, power, and politics, okay? So let's stay with the, the two first ones, and they will tell you where you should go with consumption policy if you, if you open up a little bit. They're, they have some predictability built in. Ignorance, and professionalism. So if you want to open up the preference function of EU commission policymakers, for instance, you'd say, okay, let's go where there's less ignorance and maybe more professional commonality of you know, spirit and methods, more epistemological um, common ground between, between experts. And so I'm going to dive into some very concrete um, um, uh, statements here. I think the two areas in which you have the most commonality and the less ignorance between commission bureaucrats and other experts in governments are the discussion on inflation, central banking, and the discussion on competitiveness. And these are the two areas where conscious policymakers should look into. So on inflation, for instance, the question is, what can competition policy do? In an industry in which you have firms with you know, markups, pretty high markups, and there's um, some inflation going on, you may ask yourself as a conscious policymaker, whether there's not tacit or explicit collusion when the entire industry basically replicates the inflation rates in, in its pricing decisions. And there's good reason to do that because inflation has a ma massive ratchet effect. So it's very hard to reverse the consequences of inflation in the long term. Competitiveness, same story, even though the politics are much, comp much more complicated. But uh, so that's where I would put the, the, the mark in terms of opening up to other public interests. Thanks a lot, Giorgio. Same question. And by the way, if you agree or disagree, feel free to address that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I mean, I guess, first of all, we want to distinguish a little bit between what goals could be integrated into antitrust enforcement, what should we find illegal that we don't find illegal now, and the other one is what should we integrate into the goals of antitrust non-enforcement? When do we exercise discretion, for example, not to enforce? So on the enforcement bit, um, my sense from the readings is that perhaps uh, enforcing uh, uh, competition law when it look, looking at the labor side of the market can be helpful. And this is already a, a policy priority or a policy uh, guide taken by some national competition authorities in the EU. I don't think there's any problem with doing that, actually. Uh, you know, the consumer welfare standard is capacious enough to deal with harms to the labor side of the market. If you look at the Supreme Court in Austin, the court didn't blink an eye and said, yeah, sure, there's monopsony power, that's an antitrust problem. Problem. But I think that could be an issue which where more enforcement could be placed, and then that would redress some of what Angela Wigger was talking about earlier today about capitalism causing harm to a particular segment of the population, which at the moment is not benefiting from enforcement as much as it, as it could be. Not necessarily with per se rules, but that could be a, a place for um, application. In the context of non-enforcement, I would like to maybe, rather than saying what we should not be concerned about, it's important that when we talk about non-enforcement, for most of the methods we use, it is the firm that would like competition law not to apply to them that has to make a case that competition law should not apply to them. So the default setting is your conduct is anti-competitive. So the green cartel is anti-competitive unless you make a case. And in the EU, you have to make the case on two factors. First of all, 
uh, that the cartel or the agreement is necessary to achieve the benefit. And secondly, that uh, the consumer gets a fair share of that benefit. And those are not easy benchmarks to, to shift. And although I'm all in favor of saying we should exempt all sorts of interests, uh, it is important that whatever the interest you want to have exempted, you make a case for it. And uh, I'm not so sure that uh, many firms will be able to make a case that the restriction is necessary or that it yields a, a fair share to consumers. On the fair share of consumers point, just one, one, one issue, which is that, um, uh, some uh, agencies, the Commission in particular, appear to interpret that a little bit more broadly than, than necessary, but we can maybe discuss that later. I've heard the word agree or disagree. Yeah, so I think I have a slight disagreement with Giorgio uh, on labor markets. I think there's no justification for the neglects in antitrust methods over um, buyer markets. And so we should you know, spend more time thinking about you know, monopsony power on, and labor markets might just be one uh you, you know use case for uh, um, uh, but you know considering what i said about um the difficulties of integration i'm reminded of um a lawyer a professor of law i can't recall in a famous uk university labor law and he mostly self-identify as a progressive and i once explained to him i said look you know in antitrust there's a big uh, labor market agenda now and the first thing he said, he said, you know, please leave us alone. Uh, we, we can fix this, right? And, and I, that ties to what I was saying about uh, professionalism and ignorance to the extent that oftentimes in the antitrust uh, policy uh, fields, uh, we believe we know better and we can solve very, you know, complicated problems. And we also believe that antitrust is the sole instrument in the toolbox. But you know, in, in, in continental Europe, at least, we have very sophisticated labor market regulation. And labor lawyers have very good tools to ensure you know, minimum wage, uh, um, you know, the ban on non-competes. I mean, this is a very US discussion. Every labor lawyer I know in Belgium uh, has had like you know, hundreds of, of non-compete cases and judges enforce the law on non-competes. So you know, that sort of isolation that we have in antitrust, oh, let's do something about labor markets. I think at the methodological label, le level, I agree with that. But at the substantive level, it's it's sort of assuming that antitrust law in Europe operates without labor law, which is to me a wild, um, you know, wild assumption. So we should go to labor lawyers and ask them what they need, because if we don't do that, I mean, this is the first thing we should do. Which echoes the point that Julian made. Uh, where are you, Julian? No one. Yeah, there, right? So there is no sustainability law. Uh, and here it's a very much different situation. You do have labor law, but maybe you want to answer. No, no, we I mean, don't have to. No. No, methodologically, you're right. Uh, the, the other question arises whether it, other fields of law have the correct, the adequate enforcement powers. Yeah. And so there are some fields where there's just blatant under enforcement because you rely on private litigation to solve the issue. So there, there may be a gap filling up. I mean, you know, I'm French. You know, you just saw pictures of Paris these days. You really understand that labor law is a big thing, right? All right, uh, let's 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 move on. By the way, I stopped the vote. It's like what a dictator would do because it was too good. The results were 50-50%, right? So I had to stop the vote there. Um, it will be very convenient toward the end of this panel. Um, now the question, and I will start with you, Giorgio, is the mirror question. So which objective you think should clearly remain outside of antitrust rules and standards and policies? Okay. I have two. Um, the first is uh, market integration. This has been a mistake from Constant and Grunding 1966 onwards. To say that a vertical restraint is problematic because it dis dis dismantles the market is, is the most fundamental error in EU competition policy. If there's any over-enforcement, it's there. And the recent cases on, on e-commerce and banning uh, undertakings from uh, preventing distribution through the internet, I mean, if they want to shoot themselves in the foot, it's their freedom to do so. Uh, so I think there's a huge problem with thinking that market integration is achieved by applying competition policies, the reverse actually, mm -hmm. by not applying competition policy, you integrate the markets more, plenty of examples. Um, the other one that I, I've written down before the discussion today, and I'll stick to it, is industrial policy, if it is understood as a factor to allow otherwise anti-competitive 
conduct. So not industrial policy in the broad sense, but in this very narrow sense of saying, this is anti-competitive, should we exempt it? And I don't think that we should really get our feet dirty in that. Now, we may well, as Filippo said, have the government do it. So in the Netherlands, uh, the government has a ministerial override over mergers, and it has decided in the public interest that uh, the postal sector should be run by a monopolist instead of having a, a rival uh, to compete against the incumbent. But even there, uh, the decision is to be motivated. And so the politicians have to step up and say, I am going to run against my competition authority who has made a decision saying this is mm. an anti-competitive merger. What is your justification for it? So maybe there is a political override, but, but even that requiring some transparency may limit the government's uh, discretion. Thanks a lot, Nico. Yeah, so... Um... You know, I'm a very empirical person, so I can't really say like this, like, you know, what should remain out, out of the bounds for antitrust. You know, it's, it's funny, there's this book from Giuliano Amato, Antitrust and the Bounds of Power, and it seems the discussion is power and the bounds of antitrust these days. Uh -huh. um, so that's what we want to, yeah, that would be a good title for um, an LLM dissertation. Okay, I think what should be off the antitrust table by all means is what I call antitrust weaponization. Uh, in America, you might call this antitrust stolarization. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can do that to Matt. Um, he's got a thick skin. He can, he can take it, I'm sure. Um, so the idea here is that uh, weaponization occurs when antitrust liability is used regardless of the degree of market power or consumer harm. Um, um, in you know in in the economy to pursue compliance with laws that have other objectives. Okay, I'm going to take a real life example. So a firm breaches privacy law and is declared guilty under the antitrust rules without any market power events. Okay, uh, the clearest example is the German Facebook case. Okay, so it's out of touch with the antitrust idea that you need to show a change in levels of market power or a change in consumer welfare allocation uh, in a specific market. It's away from the core objective that Monty, not Mario, but Giorgio defined <laughs> in a 2002 paper as protecting economic freedom, efficiency, and the internal markets. So, you know, weaponization is the preferred weapon of autocrats, plutocrats, and dictators, and it's 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 the whole of fame of weaponization of law is corruption law and sedition law in you know countries that are you know really turning sort of undemocratic um, um, directions. So I don't want to see antitrust being used to this. There's like many legal you know reasons to to not do that, like due process, equal treatment under law, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into that, but that should be completely off table. All right, I have a very basic reading of that case, article one and two says an abuse of a dominant position and the off I think is missing in the case against Facebook, but anyway. Um, so Nicola, you said we can maybe use antitrust for to, to in the fight against inflation and also for competitiveness reasons. What we shouldn't do is the weaponization of antitrust. Giorgio, you said, well, maybe we want to go in the direction of doing more labor um, and worker rights. What we shouldn't do is market integration or at the very least the way it has been done uh, in the past. Now, my question that was we'll talked with you, Giorgio, is with this in mind, so those objectives that you think we could, we could implement and the ones that we should avoid, is there any need for institutional change within the agencies, whether we talk about the personnel, the way they are, you know, the divide between the, the case handlers and uh, body making the decisions, I don't know, anything. So is there any need for in institutional change? And Nicola, I will go to you then for the same question. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, if we pick up on Nicola's points about uh, how to uh, merge two competing policy goals that make them work together, then you want the agencies to collaborate a lot more intensely yeah. with each other. So maybe interagency collaboration could be something that is thought about. Uh, uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, it has been begun. So in the UK, the CMA works with other cognate regulators to think about digital markets. And one of the things that uh, emerged, I, I interviewed some of the people working there, is the total difference in language that they speak. So Miri, a lot of the points you said, look, we are talking about uh, market failure. They're talking about breach of privacy. We're actually talking about the same thing. So a lot of it is language that we use is very 
different, and yet we're both talking about the same thing. So bringing agencies together, I think, can be helpful, but there are a huge number of barriers, let alone the other points that you mentioned in your long list, but just the way in which we approach the subject is, is completely different. I think that's one thing to do. Um, the other, however, may also be, so if you want to authorize certain conduct, which is anti-competitive, but you think it's in the public interest that it should be should be done so, and this mirrors a little bit what you said, Thibault, about uh, uh, proof of vigilance, is to actually supervise this. And I think the Hellenic Competition Commission's uh, sandbox for sustainability is a good example. We say, okay, you think you have a case where your cartel is green? Okay. I let you free for a few years, but I will look at what you're doing and I want to see some results. So I think that causes for a bit of a change in the way an agency operates. So it's not just a policeman that says what you're doing is wrong, but it's a supervisor. And that's a culture change for a competition authority that reviews uh, the conduct of firms. Of course, there are examples where competition authorities do supervise conduct. Uh, so uh, commitments in mergers, commitments in Article uh, 9 of Regulation 1 require the parties to report back to the commission. But some more intensive supervision may be necessary if you think there is a justification for deviating from the core values of consumer welfare. Thanks a lot. No worries. I have questions for the, those two to oppose eventually, right? Because so far they've been building on top of each other and trying to be constructive, which is not what we want on a panel end of the day. Nicola, please go ahead. Yeah, so I also had uh, built technical networks of regulators like in the DMA in, in a way. I mean, this is one of the good things about the DMA. Um, yeah, one of the good things. Um, and so, okay, so one thing that I would really like to see is um, it would help if the European Commission, I'm talking about the European Commission here, could produce more integrated, that ties to your point, Thibault, more integrated um, approaches of its activities. So I'm going to be very concrete here. So we are on the, on the, on the uh, ends of a 25 years real life experiments of injecting competition at every layer of the semiconductor industry. Um, Article 101 cases, the DRAM uh, cartel case, Article 102, Rambus, Qualcomm, Intel, Broadcom, merger cases, uh, Intel Mobili, Qualcomm NXP, and uh, NVIDIA ARM, right? So I, I still don't make sense to myself why the European Commission with so much knowledge about these industries has not produced yet a report or put a team together to understand what this multi-layer approach of competition enforcement, intense scrutiny of, of various layers in the semiconductor value chain has produced. All these cases are taken one by one. And so you hear that Intel is the subject of an Article 102 investigation. A year later, you hear that Broadcom is subject to an Article 102 investigation. But wait a minute, aren't Broadcom and Intel competitors in some markets or suppliers in others? So connecting the dots is something that commission agencies do not do. And, and it's a big miss for building you know, good knowledge about what antitrust enforcement actually achieved. I mean, I can't believe that we're like you know, 20 or 25 years after the Microsoft case, and we still don't know if that massive scale intervention from governments increased or decreased competition. Well, okay, mm. okay. It will be probably 50, 50%, yeah, if we were to ask right. the room, yeah. <laughs> That's a bold statement. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'd like to see that, like, you know, rather than having like a directorate general, a directorate for mergers, a unit for, you know, anti-competitive 101, 102, you know, have this sort of, you know, integrated value chain um, assessments and, and reports to understand what, you know, what's going on. So that is also something that the UK, we haven't be, been discussing the UK much, which, you know, feels good sometimes, um, but they've been doing pretty well, right? With cooperation between the, a bunch of enforcers, including the competition agency, data protection agency, IP, and so on and so forth. What I want to do now is to, and we already, touched upon that a little bit, move from the question of whether or not we should broaden the objectives and take more optimistic or pessimistic view, depending on your political stance, uh, and start from the premise and the hypothesis that it's coming, right? It's like winter's coming. Um, so how do we do it, knowing that it's coming? And my question that I will start with you, Nicola, is how do we balance those objectives? Let's take the ones that you think, you know, inflation and labor. So let's say, okay, we want to do more of that 
plus, I suppose, consumer welfare standard to some degree. How do we prioritize between those objectives? And my question, I guess, is the following. Should we favor the one that we can quantify? Um, and if so, how do we quantify those objectives, right? Uh, this might be not so easy. Um, and if so, indeed, the question would become, isn't it a risk that we'll just go for whatever we can quantify, something that is very static and you know, forget about the dynamic efficiencies? And if you answer no to this question, meaning no, we should, you know, in the way we balance those objectives, we should not necessarily go for the one we can quantify. Then the question becomes, well, but what about public choice, right? And all the, the issues that you can never held the agencies accountable if there is never anything that you can quantify and everything is qualitative. So please, Nicola, the floor is yours. Yeah, look, I think we are trying to reinvent the wheel here because, you know, um, modern uh, legal systems have used uh, two procedures to do that. Uh, one is the court system and the other one is delegation to expert agencies subject to accountability review. Um, you know, judges spend all their time dealing with trade-offs. And, you know, that's what you do as a judge. I mean, you know, you are sort of, you know, confronting, you know, various, you know, values and and commands from the, from the law and you're comparing a lot of things. And, and you know, it's it strikes me that you know, I don't think any of these judges is trying to measure, you know, units of, you know, privacy versus units of, of uh, consumer welfare versus units of poverty versus uh, this and that. So we delegate, that's what we do. Um, now, one other sort of fallacy that we stumble into in this discussion, that's the second point I want to make, is the fallacy of the first best. So, you know, there is this, I don't know where this comes from, but we believe that we should optimize all variables in the preference function. So if you have n variables, you should basically maximize every of the variables. And this is, you know, what economists call the, the fallacy of the first best. It's not possible to do that. So you're in the second best world. And then in the second best world, you can, you know, decide whether you want to be in the piecemeal approach to second best, where in which you're going to say, I'm just going to you know, because I can't really do optimize across variables, I'm going to pick one because it's the most important one. And sometimes the law will tell you it's more important. Or you can say, I'm going to reason, I'm going to try to reason with a small set of variables. That's what EU law requires. Article 1013 says you can, you can uh, compare, not balance, as Giorgio wrote in another paper, you can compare restrictions, anti -com sorry, anti-competitive effects with economic benefits in distribution and technology, for instance, mm. right? And so the law requires the judges to do that if evidence is brought to the table. US law doesn't allow that, right? So section one of the Sherman Act doesn't allow that. So section one of the Sherman Act is very, very hard on its, on its reading. So I think in the EU law, we are in this second best world and we have a you know, restricted set of preferences that we can try to, to improve and we trust judges and agencies to, to do this. Follow-up question, are you happy with those concepts such as probable effects or would you require that the courts have to show something a bit you know, no, more you know, quantified? Yeah, so the problem, the problem is the European courts for a long time have given a completely you know, free check to the European Commission to just say likely effects and it was taken as an article of faith. And so that has been the problem for a very long time. There was the, you know, the law on evidence. I mean, you can talk to a lot of lawyers in Brussels and you say, you know, uh, what are the rules of evidence before the EU courts? They tell you there's no rules of evidence in the EU courts. It doesn't exist. It exists in the minds of, you know, people like me who write academic books have never been in a case. The evidence that's needed is the evidence that's if it's enough for the commission to convince itself that the case is sound, that's it. So from that, the court has moved the law into something that's more demanding on the commission in terms of establishing a likelihood of effect. And I think this is a good direction. A lot of people are unhappy about this because of course this doesn't go with the sort of you know, movement towards you know, more enforcement and this and that, but I think it's very sound. Yeah, that's also what we see when it comes to market power, right? Where you see that the more it goes, the more you have to show indeed more than just the market shares. And the wording of the court is actually quite clear. Giorgio, I come to you. So how do we balance those objectives? Do we favor quantifiable data? Should we take qualitative studies into account and how should we do that? Okay, um, I think there are six ways 
of doing the balancing that do you do if you think you need to balance. Um, so I think all of them are problematic. So I'm just saying what 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 happens. So sometimes you can say, well, we can exclude one value because another one takes priority. So mm -hmm. a nice example is uh, UEFA has a monopoly in organizing football, but that's good because the European model of sport benefits. And therefore we say no competition in organizing football matches, but on the other hand, society gains because we have a better football society overall. So you can just say you can just say one is more important than the other, and you can put the various goals in some sort of order, uh, and you have to try and justify why you put one on top of the other. And the other thing you could do is you could translate a policy goal into a consumer welfare thing. So you're comparing like with like. So take the privacy point that that Nicola mentioned. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the Facebook case in Germany is problematic, but there is one story that the competition agency they ran, which is about exclusionary potential, is by gathering all this data. Am I likely to exclude rivals in the relevant market? And so that maybe then builds more into a, a competition story you, you recognize. The, the third is that sometimes you see that agencies use non-economic benefits to kind of tip the balance. We're not really sure if this is pro or anti-competitive, but we are fairly sure that it'll increase employment in the depleted area of North Portugal. Therefore, we'll allow this agreement, notwithstanding our doubts as to its legality. Mm. Um, sometimes what you do is you allow things with conditions. You say, yes, you can merge, but you must do so and so and so. Uh, the fifth thing you can do is you can balance the negative and the positive effects, but I'd like to see anybody give me one decision where that has happened. The only one I can think of is the CESED washing machine case where we're using, you know, back of the envelope calculations. Uh, the commission said that the consumer is going to pay more for the washing machines, but there's going to be so much less energy consumption that this is actually a good thing for society because less energy consumption means, means less pollution. So, but that was really back of the envelope stuff and the commission doesn't like that particular paragraph and tries to write it out of all the guidelines ever since. And the other point that has been mentioned already uh, by a number of people uh, in the audience and is discussed quite at length by Orr Brook in her thesis is to exercise prosecutorial discretion or as the first speaker this morning put it, to have priorities. And so if we deprioritize, we're kind of saying we allow green cartels because we're not going to prosecute them. I think that's the worst way of taking into account competition interest by just saying, I am not interested, because you're just saying, I, as a person, am not interested. It doesn't mean the institution is not interested. And remember, Articles 101 and 102 have direct effect. And so even if you are not interested, a litigant might be interested. So you're not offering any sort of legal security by that latter uh, criterion. I will merge two of the remaining questions into one. Then we will go to the Q&A. Then I will be asking you to vote once again. And I have some surprise questions. So we. Don't do the Q&A toward the end. But before that, the last substantial question I have is the following. Something you've mentioned, Giorgio, um, and also when preparing the panel, is that if you broaden, indeed, the goal of antitrust, it doesn't mean necessarily more enforcement, right? It could be that you also want to give free pass to, to some practices. So now the question is, which practices do you think should be prohibited by competition law that are currently legal under the rules of competition law? Um, and or the mirror, mirror question once again. So which practices that you think are currently accepted by competition law should tomorrow be prohibited using competition rules? So Nicola, I'll start with you. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to say something that some people in the room will not like, but I think uh, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> um, not, I'm not paid to be, to be uh, liked by people. Um, so... So I think we should really think seriously about whether the level of the levels of advertisement in digital industries are not excessive. Um, every, you know, functional democracy uh, in the world has regulation that tries to minimize or limit the space of advertisement in certain areas, like the political process or exposition to ads, and certain products are not advertised. And I think this reflection has not really taken place with digital, which is all based on advertisements. And it would be nice to have a healthy discussion about this. So that's one. The second one is bargains. So um, if you push the idea of uh, first line, first degree price discrimination, so perfect price discrimination in markets too far, the problem is that there are no surplus gains in markets to make for a large portion of the population. The gains of trades are in existence for a large share of the population. And if there's no gains from trade afforded by markets, markets will collapse. You're gonna have what you are seeing in Paris today. People, the support for markets will dwindle. 
you know, markets can exist based on a popular consensus about the possibility to make gains from trade by going to markets. If this possibility disappears, even though you have efficiency effects because you serve the entire range of outputs, if this possibility disappears, markets support to free markets will disappear. So you need to maintain a degree of, um, uh, you know, gains from trades on both sides of the table. And this forces us to think really hard about the problem of perfect price discrimination. Giorgio. Thanks. Yeah, I'll also try and say something a little bit heretical in this room. Um, <laughs> so what's the biggest antitrust exemption out there? Uh, that uh, dominant firms are free now after the recent judgments of the court from Intel onwards to do whatever they like to exclude their rivals. If you look at Intel, SEN, Unilever, the incumbent has a lot of flexibility to do whatever it likes to exclude rivals because the competition authority has to come up with a theory of harm which is based upon the as efficient competitor standard being met. My sense is that we should have more presumptions of illegality, uh, allow the dominant company to come up with defenses, but give a lighter run to, to the commission. And the background to this is that we want to stimulate entry in the market by new entrants. And I think this case law uh, from Intel onwards seems to twist the balance too much in favor of the incumbents and too little in favor of the entrant. So that's my uh, suggestion of what we is currently accepted uh, because it's no longer an infringement to abuse your dominant position to actually tighten up uh, abuse of dominance. And I think there, I agree with Nicola, but from a different perspective, which is that agencies may get frustrated uh, if uh, they're not able to use the tools they have, which is why we have the DMA. Uh, so, you know, if, if you make it too hard for the for a particular po policy to be met by antitrust, maybe you, you, you end up with a worse thing than antitrust, which is regulation. Um, on what we should maybe be more generous on, um, I just read recently the collective labor agreements guidelines of the commission. I think it's too soft a document. Uh, it's too hedgy and there where they should just have a much more generous safe harbor when it comes to solo self-employed workers uh, bargaining collectively. Now we move on to the Q&A, we have about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for that. So by all means. Yeah, Back. please, Julian, in the, yeah. You have two options, you can scream, yeah. <laughs> And that was too loud, sorry. Um, you mentioned a CSET case, and uh, and I'm like thinking whether I disagree there with you, because I think the part that you actually sh highlighted, which was the cost savings by the consumers, I think that is has been in the last years always the one that the commission tried to highlight, uh, the cost versus the savings. That's That's how I read it. And then there's the other part of the CSET with the CO2 emissions, which uh, was uh, uh, the one that uh, uh, they, they, they tried to forget. But my question here is essentially, if you wanted to do any kind of balancing in that thing, I have not seen in 101 or 102 uh, in commission decisions, clear examples, maybe CSET the only one, where you see the costs um, actually calculated for the consumer. So if you don't calculate the costs of the restriction, how can you uh, do any kind of balancing uh, in that sense? And I, and I can imagine uh, all consumers and uh, uh, damages claimants would be super happy if the commission puts a figure there and says, uh, the damage of the cartel has been X, and then I just bring in my follow-on damages based on that, it would be amazing. If you want to answer, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, on CESA that we actually agree. It's the paragraph on the total energy savings that I don't like, that I mentioned. But there is another one, which is about the total consumer savings, which is the commission wants to push. Yeah. Uh, on your point, you might want to look at the Supreme Court of Canada's judgment in the Tervita merger, where they say, indeed, uh, in a merger case, the competition authority has to quantify the harm because in Canada, there's a total welfare efficiency defense. So there is one country where Oliver Williamson's 1968 paper was successful, which is Canada. And there they said, indeed, as you said, but from a different perspective, they said if the defendant is going to mount an efficiency defense, he needs to know how much harm the merger is predicted to have caused before they can quantify their benefits. Uh, whether you like that or not, that's what they've said. Something that strikes me, and then I give you the floor, is that, and it's fairly recent, 
in the past, if you look at the annual reports of most of the agencies, what they were saying is that last year we imposed for, I don't know, one, two, three billion USD in fines. Therefore, give us more money, right? Increase the budget of the agency. Uh, the logic being that the more we have staff, the more we can enforce, the more we make money for the state. And now what you see, and the FTC is doing it, the European Commission, uh, Commission is doing it, the French Competition Agency, the Netherlands, and a few others, now they do say, well, for one euro that we spend, we actually provide 20 euros, usually that's the, the range, back to consumers. So to your point, Julian, they, I mean, I'm sure there is some, I mean, I'm sure, I hope <laughs> there is some calculus behind. So surely they must be in a position to quantify the damage done to consumers in the case law. But Nicola, you wanted to react. Yeah, I want to say that I disagree with Giorgio. <laughs> and... <laughs> on the um, you know biggest exemption in antitrust these days. So I think the biggest exemption is, of course, the opaque exemption, uh, which is you know the most uh, institutionalized and historical cartel that the world knows of. And this is uh, subject to no antitrust ammunition whatsoever. I think the AEC test is getting you know, too much criticism here because the AEC test would allow the agency or the courts to find abuse if it was proven that the the rival would be as or more efficient than the dominant firm at the current scale of the dominant firm so if you have a uber that comes in the taxi market and show that if it had if it could enjoy the share of the taxi drivers it would it's its average cost per unit would be lower than the taxi the taxi drivers the the, the as efficient competitor test would allow the agency to find abuse from the taxi drivers in relation to exclusionary behavior. That's not an exemption. Plus, the second thing is the AEC test doesn't really apply in non-pricing cases. So, you know, as long as, you know, you're looking for non-pricing abuses, uh, I don't see an exemption here. But do we have any other questions? Yeah, please, Filippo. On, on data availability. So we all want to measure things, but more and more data is private, right? So more and more it becomes harder to measure stuff. How should this impact prosecutorial discretion and how should this impact presumption in cases as well in your view and towards one way or another? What, what kind of concrete case do you have in mind? I think even like as efficient competitor tests, it's like the data on costs or things like these are internal data or a lot of the cases that involve like privacy collection on how much how much company collect. We have absolutely no idea. Most of the cases we have no idea. It's very hard for companies, for governments to just require the data mm -hmm. from companies. They have no incentives to provide. So in, in a way, I understand the push of measuring more and more and more. And I think everybody agrees with that. But this is in a world where data is less and less and less public available. Yeah. So, so yeah. there's a clear tension between both worlds there. And I think we haven't thought of a way of if there's a role for presumptions and other things to, to force data production in a way that we can actually measure policies. Like that uh, we can it would be a rough uh, jump to move to presumptions because you can't measure. I think, you know, if you can't measure, the jump should be, let's try to measure more or, you know, something else. But, you know, moving to presumptions because... It's hard to find the evidence. I mean, that's just a weird logic, I think. Can, can I ask a question actually to one of you? If you could dive into what the general court, when it comes to the counterfactual, I think it's pretty unique. If one of you two, no? So yeah, please go ahead. It is the, it is the segment in which it is said that, uh, is this the segment in which said like Google recover the cost of building Android? So. So that's not the one I have in mind. The one I have in mind is when the general court says um, you can't really do a counterfactual because it would imply that you will have a similar market without the practice being implemented. And there is, of course, just one such market for, for smartphone in Europe, right? So when it comes to counterfactual and to your point, it seems that uh, the requirements are even less, you know, or smaller yeah. to some degree to what they have been in the past, so I, but it's paragraph 800. In the Court of Appeals um, opinion in the US Microsoft case, the court was very clear that you didn't need, you know, extreme counterfactual accuracy to establish a violation of section two. And I think this is correct. You can't just, you know, ask the agency to rebuild the virtual world if this world never existed in the first place. So you probably need to give a little bit of leeway to the agency. Now, requesting counterfactual information is interesting because it's one of the canon of scientific 
um, production. And, you know, it's the basic rule of evidence in any course in, you know, dealing with testing propositions, you need to have an, a rough idea of the counterfactual world. So maybe, you know, maybe, of course, but maybe, um, no, you don't get this, it's a private joke between Tim and myself. So of course, counterfactual is important, but maybe the court has gone, to, you know, we are going too far in requesting the evidence. Which is also interesting if you take, you know, the subjects of this panel into account, the complexity you see there may mean that, well, providing a counterfactual when it comes to measuring the impacts in the environment and worker rights might be even harder. Filippo, you have another question. No. No. Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah. So the Philip start monopolizing the Q and A. I approve. Um, I have a question for Nicola because you made this really interesting point about putting the competition bureaucrats in a room with the other experts on other um, broader social goals that you might want to pursue. So my first question is: um, if um, the current combination of competition and DG Connect people for the DMA enforcement is what you have in mind, is that an example of where this will work very well, most likely, or is that completely unrelated? And the second question on this is, um, you mentioned inflation as a good example, where um, competition people might work together with other experts to pursue two um, worthwhile social goals. And whenever inflation rises, you get these very bad takes on Twitter by politicians like Biden who say, okay, uh, firms are greedy, that's why prices are going up, which of course doesn't make a ton of sense. But if there's such low hanging fruit in terms of combining economic expertise to improve the situation in terms of competition and inflation, why is nobody proposing this? Is it too difficult for politicians to grasp? Is it too attractive to do a stupid populist argument instead of proposing something that really harnesses the power of central bank experts and competition experts? You have one minute. Yeah, no, and Giorgio can, I'm sure Giorgio has a, an idea on this because, so one of the obstacles as lawyers is you, you'd need some, you know, functional doctrine of collective dominance slash tacit collusion to work on cases like this. And the law has been very uh, difficult to mobilize against tacit collusion in the US and in the EU. I think there is some leeway in the law to work on this. But every time I spoke about tac of tacit collusion with EC commission officials, they always told me, you know, this is stuff that academics do, but we are not interested. So there's not a lot of interest in the commission departments of agencies to go after these possible cases of price parallelism and, and this and that. You know, and, and also there might be a sense as well, you know, response to the public opinion. This discussion is very polarized. You know, you get people like Larry Summers who can't really answer the questions of John Adams on inflation. I mean, it's it's uh, it's embarrassing. Um, uh, but at the same time, you get like wild statements from the you know the far left uh, that say you know every company is greedy. Oh yeah, well great. You know, companies want to make profits. Well, welcome to new world. I mean, so I understand they don't want to go into this um, you know cesspool of uh, you know polarization, and and you know given there's no very strong legal remedy, they are very careful. But I think we we, we can probably do more here. Um, yeah, I don't know what Georgia thinks. So yes, much. if you want to react again, you don't have to. Sure. No, I mean, on DigiCom, DigiConnect, but this is exactly where maybe culture matters, right? Because DigiConnect has never been an enforcer, so they don't have enforcement experience, but also they have experience of looking at enforcement, which is a totally differently designed. They are much more about ex ante and about setting targets and about bargaining with the firms about how the markets should open. So mm -hmm. it'll be an interesting clash of cultures between them. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Can I just get back to the data point? I agree. Uh, it's funny on this because um, so Frank Easterbrook in 1984 in the famous paper, The Limits of Antitrust said, you know, uh, lawyers know less than businessmen and judges know less than lawyers about the economy. But then you look at the Intel case and you realize that the businessmen themselves didn't know what they were doing because nobody could find out what the rebates were. And so the whole case of the commission collapses because there is just nobody in the whole firm appears to know what discounts were given to which supplier, which makes these very data heavy cases quite problematic. And so the more evidentiary burdens you place on the agency, which of course is legitimate that you want to convict because there's evidence. But you know, if the evidence is just there because nobody knows what they're doing, then that's interesting. Um, but there is data. So for example, 
example, a lot of people have studied mergers and have done merger retrospectives. I mean, everybody knows the usual studies, but the one I'd like to emphasize is the DG competition remedy studies in 2005, where they picked a sample of, I think, 60 random mergers, and they said, okay, we solved these with a remedy. What was the solution? Yeah. And they realized, well, it didn't always actually work. So how can we improve our merger remedy design to make mergers work better? And I think exercises like this are really painful for an agency to do, which is why nobody does it, because they're actually showing that you're making mistakes. And as you said, you know, if you're going to test with data, what are we going to do to make ourselves better? You don't want to say we've done something bad. We want to say for every euro you've given us, we've given 20 euro back, which is a terrible measure. Something I did not mention on the list of the people you may want to hire are historians, right? If you want to conduct such retrospective studies. Here's what we're going to do. We have 10 minutes left. First, you're going to vote once again. So if you go on the same, very same link, um, you get asked the very same question. Uh, we get the result where 50-50. So the question again is, should antitrust pursue broader goals than consumer welfare? You need the QR, yeah, the QR code. Uh, and or you go to slido.com and the event code is ICLE. If we can get the QR code on the screen, that will be very convenient or else you could just refresh the page. Um, I see eight people have voted already. All right. Um, Good. Yes. Thanks for the QR codes. Okay. I'll give you the result toward the very end. So in about five to seven minutes. Now, I don't want them to see my question, so I'm going to hide a little bit. And I'm going to ask you, I really appreciate that you've been answering short answers to very complex questions. I have five surprise questions. Um, I'll start, you know, to be fair with you, Nicola, and then Giorgio, and we'll go back and forth. First question. It's not so hard. Which agency, in regard to our discussion, is doing... The, the best job right now. No, it's not it's quiz, ah. quiz, it's uh, your opinion. So which agency agency you think is actually moving in the right direction regarding the subject of this panel? Um, I like the UK approach to policymaking. I think they are careful, they study, they write good reports. I think, you know, the UK took a lot of bad press these past years in Europe, but I think their approach to policy making dominates um, what I see in Brussels, for instance. Ojo. Yeah, I'll be controversial. The you, can't, you can't say the same. The Dutch, the because I'm living there, no, uh, because they're taking risks and they're doing cases that are a bit abnormal and let's see what happens. And a good dose of experimentation doesn't hurt. Uh, go back to experimentation. All right, then I'll start with you, Giorgio. Question number two, what are the best articles you've read, again, discussing the subject we've been discussing today? Okay. Or, the, or the best article, you could just sure. give me one. I'll, I'll mention one, Rebecca Hall Allensworth. You can't the, mention yours, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I have. <laughs> uh, Rebecca Allensworth, The Incommensurability Myth of Antitrust, 2016. I don't remember the, the journal. I yeah. think that's a really good discussion of, of balancing and the challenges that agencies face if they think about balancing. From Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt. I believe. Yeah, Nico. I'm a big fan of um, 1984, uh, The Limits of Antitrust. Frank Easterbrook. Uh -huh. I didn't take a wrinkle. Okay. All right. Thanks. Nico, what is the best argument you've heard today on one of the panels? Something that, you know, you never thought of and you, you thought, well, that's actually quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, the best arguments against the argument with the argument that, you know, the best argument against the argument with this, these statements, these wild statements I find about capitalism, uh, which assume away the existence of a ton of social welfare regulation, taxes, uh, subsidies, and institutions and law, laws like, you know, labor law, safety law, consumer protection, privacy and so on and so forth. You have to live on a different planet to believe that we're not in, a, in an era of intense legislation and public and, and you know, enforcement so of the law. There's a lot of push for more. Um, so I think you know, these are statements I hear on the UI campus. These are statements I hear in a lot of areas. I don't think they're real. Giorgio. 
I think it was a point in the sustainability panel when somebody said, well, you know, but what are the side effects of authorizing anti-competitive conduct in the public interest if the public interest then shifts somewhere else? And I've seen the argument before, but I think the general point is you want to do good, but what is it that after you've done the good, what happens uh, in reality? What is the sort of the secondary consequence of having done the good? And I think that's something we want to think about a little bit, the unexpected consequences of enforcement. All right, thanks a lot. Fourth, Giorgio, you first. What is the question, the most important question that I failed to ask during this panel that you would like me to ask? And please answer the question. <laughs> Something you really want me to ask, which you know I failed miserably. Um, <laughs> gosh, we agreed the questions beforehand, so it's kind of hard to say what you hadn't asked. Um, um, I mean, uh, at this point about measurement. Um, so you said before we should then take stock and then Nicolas said, oh, we should take stock of all these cases. I have two responses to that. First, the commission does do this to a certain extent with market investigation. It does so ex ante. It says, okay, let's take the pharma market. What are the problems? And let's gather as much data as we can to diagnose the problems. And then we run a series of cases. So there is, that does exist. The other point is how much can we really measure the success of a competition authority? So this idea that, oh, we've taken so many cases and we've generated so much consumer welfare is problem because if your job is to deter, then we haven't done anything this year is actually your best chance of saying you're successful because you've effectively deterred all cartels. Mm -hmm. If you're doing more and more cartel cases, then you're not actually doing your job because you're not generating general deterrence. So this measurement idea, which came from, from the uh, chief economist of the Dutch Competition Authority, and that's now in the OCD, is, is problematic. But it's also problematic. So I'm studying now um, industrial uh, regulation of, of industrial safety. And even there, a lot of the people who are interviewed about, is a health and safety regulator a good thing? We don't know if we are reducing accidents by our enforcement. Yeah, accidents are going down. Is it because of us? Hmm. We don't know. And yet, as soon as there is an industrial accident, people will say, ah, you're not regulating heavily enough. So we, I think it's difficult for a competition authority, and I haven't seen a single paper that justifies its existence in this very granular way. The best studies you have, um, there's a paper, I don't remember the author, who said, look, countries with a competition authority that is active generally improve welfare more than countries with other competition authority which isn't active at this macro level we can say something but uh, uh, but at a more granular level we really yeah. can so I, I although yes it would be nice to measure how effective enforcement yeah. is i don't know if we can i, I never know if i've always been told that in japan or maybe another country you only pay the doctor when you're not sick i don't know if that is true but i believe there is it used to be china right so that would be quite similar right you only say as an agency that you've done a good job if you've enforced nothing because everything goes well. <laughs> All right, Nico. Yeah, so uh, there's two things. Uh, the one thing that we didn't discuss is innovation, uh, business dynamism, new firm creation, entry and exit. Um, and, you know, I think your first question, it was, you know, what should antitrust be about? And the, the I mean, my answer to that question would be in Europe, so I'm not talking about the but US. You got to answer the question, right? Sorry? You got to answer the question. So I am answering the question now. In Europe, what should antitrust be about? It should be about economic prosperity, growth, and pie size. That's it. Europe has an enormous problem of you know, small-scale firms, zombie companies, lack of business dynamism, low productivity. This was at the heart of the European um projects in the 1950s, growing business units after World War II. This idea has been completely lost on policy making. We need to revive this idea. You know, Americans look at Europe, they don't look at Europe, they look at China. Europe doesn't exist, just the middle ground where nothing happens. Um, it makes me very sad as a citizen and as an academic. So I think we should uh, work more on this. And that's what we try to do at the Dynamic Culture in Initiative, as you know. Dot com. A little bit of <laughs> self-referencing here to close the show, right? All right. Um, we do the result of the vote before I go to the very best question of the show. Uh, same amount of people voted. 39% answers yes. So we should pursue broader goals than the consumer welfare. And 61 are is answering no to the question take yeah make whatever you want out of that okay Giorgio I'll start with you so this panel has been about inclusion to some degree you know including more social goals I know one subject that is very inclusive and yet very political and that's Italian food so now the question Giorgio is what is the best recipe for pasta and then I'll go to you Nicola and see if you agree 
best recipe for pasta well first of all you've got to make the pasta yourself you shouldn't just buy off the shelf and you need to really you know handle it with lots of care and spend hours and hours making sure the dough is flat and then running it through your machine and after that um fresh olive oil okay nico are you kidding <laughs> um you know time as in everything i mean timing timing is of the essence right so the best recipe for pasta is you know you get the nice products and this and that and then you just uh, have to be very careful with timing that's all i know about pasta very good political political answer all right uh please join me in um applauding the members of the panel <laughs>